Okay, now we see you with uh, your uh, interesting background. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bruno, okay. and uh, thanks to the organizers for the in invitation to speak. Um, so I'm Daniel Siegel. I'm an assistant professor at the Perimeter Institute and the University of Guelph. And so in this talk, I'm going to focus uh, on specifically the post-merger stage. Uh, so uh, more specifically, the post-merger accretion disks in uh, neutron star mergers. Um, and so I'll particularly focus on some um, sort of background material, but also obviously on some uh, recent results uh, that are upcoming and that we hope to publish within uh, the next couple of weeks or so. So just to start off, we've had already uh, beautiful introductions to uh, neutron star mergers, so I can really skip this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, just to point out, that's sort of the basic merger process phenomenology. In terms of ejector masses, we have our good old dynamical ejector uh, that comes in uh, two natures, uh, so in, in two types, uh, tidal ejector. And then in the case of neutron star, neutron star binaries, uh, we also have a shock heated ejector from the collision interface. So that's the earliest ejector that comes out. And then for neutron star, neutron star mergers, uh, we do have additional complications in the early post-merger phase. And that's also been talked a lot about um, at this workshop already. So uh, we have additional winds uh, from uh, the remnant, magnetically driven winds, as we just heard from Jay uh, and others. Uh, the, in addition, uh, there's neutrino driven winds um, that need to be uh, taken into account as well. Um, there's uh, interesting phenomena related to angular momentum transport. So there's angular momentum transport via gravitational waves. Um, there can be some interesting, under certain conditions, there can be interesting nonlinear hydrodynamic phenomena that's also been talked about here at the, the workshop that can lead to this M1 um, um, sort of instability in a sense that uh, leads to spiral waves and can um, lead to additional angular momentum transport through the remnant end into the disk and drive uh, additional ejector. So there's all sorts of uh, very uh, uh, complicated um, um, phenomena in the early post-merger phase. And so what I'm really going to focus on here uh, today is uh, this post-merger phase once uh, things have sort of settled down into um, more or less axisymmetric uh, conditions. And we're left with uh, an accretion disk, uh, some material that circularizes around the remnant, be it a neutron star or a black hole. So for this talk, I'm going to focus um, specifically on, on a black hole, so assuming that any potential neutron star remnant has already collapsed uh, to, uh, to a black hole. Now, just to illustrate uh, sort of the relevance of, of these post-merger um, accretion disk outflows, uh, we all know this beautiful um, uh, first uh, multi-messenger event uh, with LIGO and its electromagnetic um, partner facilities, GW17 or 817 the kilonova, uh, so specifically the, the um, to outflows from such an um, uh, from such an accretion disk, uh, the combination of uh, sort of very heavy um, ejector mass, uh, the uh, composition, so fairly low ye, um, and so the combination also with ejector velocity sort of point in this uh, in this direction. However. Uh, LIGO is now starting to sample the uh, binary neutron star and neutron star black hole parameter space and making all sorts of uh, interesting discoveries. And so I'm also very much looking forward to 04 uh, with uh, probably lots of surprises uh, awaiting us. So just to point out this recent event, as you all know, GW1904-25, if it was actually a binary neutron star, would uh, represent an outlier by over five sigma from the galactic double neutron star population. So that's a very interesting object with total mass um, around uh, 3.4 solar masses or so. <clears throat> so um, there are definitely surprises that, that will be awaiting us. And uh, unfortunately so far without electromagnetic counterparts, but uh, that will also hopefully change uh, in the future. So I think it's uh, really time to look sort of forward and to, uh, to think about what we can actually uh, what we could potentially expect over the next couple of years. So as LIGO and Virgo and Kagra are going to sample the uh, parameter space. And so this was essentially the purpose of, of a study that hopefully comes out in a, in a couple of weeks from now with a graduate student, Sumi D, uh, leading, the, uh, leading the, the paper. And so as a starting point, I just wanted to show you here, if we sort of scan the parameter space for these post-merger uh, systems, what we might 
uh, what we might expect in terms of uh, ejecta masses. And so we're using here um, fitting functions uh, from numerical relativity simulations uh, as discussed and already introduced by Francois uh, today. So there's all sorts of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, details obviously that go uh, that go in there. Some of the fitting formulae are more accurate than others, and um, so there's also subtleties involved. But sort of as a rough guidance, uh, they can sort of tell us what, in principle, we can expect. So on the fo focusing on the binary neutron star uh, case for now, uh, you see the absolute disk masses on the left. Um, so we uh, parameterize the uh, our ignorance of the equation of state in terms of the neutron star radius for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, and you see the uh, uh, to the left in light blue, you see the bound, the uh, uh, sort of smallest possible uh, neutron star radius as inferred from GW1708-17. And you also see the nicer result um, with 13 kilometers. Um, and so in somewhere in between, we do expect um, uh, things to lie. And so if you look at sort of low mass binary neutron star systems, uh, so we're plotting here in the middle and on the right, we're plotting essentially the total disk ejector that we expect um, relative to what we expect in terms of dynamical ejector. And uh, so purple means that disk ejector dominates while green means that uh, dynamical ejector dominates. And so you can see for a low mass neutron star system where sort of the secondary, the lighter neutron star has a mass of 1.2 solar masses or so, um, essentially across the parameter space, irrespective, mostly irrespective of the, um, of the mass ratio, which is uh, on the y-axis here, uh, that disk ejector actually uh, sort of dominates uh, over all the other ejector types. Uh, so we don't include winds here, so that's an additional complication and that's a caveat, and so I'm happy to discuss this. Um, but uh, so for simplicity, we just don't include that here. Um, on the right side, you see high mass systems, um, and uh, you can see that uh, there are things change a little bit. So these uh, tend to uh, collapse more promptly to a, to a black hole and leave less uh, um, material as in, in the accretion disk. And so you have lighter accretion disks there. And so uh, dynamic ejector tend to uh, dominate at least in part of the uh, parameter space. In white, you can see some of the simulations. Uh, so these correspond to some of the disk simulations that we, uh, that we did and that I'm going to, to talk about. Um, the highest, so they are chosen according to some physical criteria I'm going to explain in a second. Um, and, uh, but just pointing out that essentially we're sampling here the parameter space um, depending on a physical condition that I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you in a, in a, in a second. Um, so this is uh, how things look for a neutron star black hole, uh, uh, for the neutron star black hole parameter space. And again, here, um, over a large fraction of the parameter space, again, um, disk ejector might actually dominate if indeed they uh, eject something like 30% or so um, of their initial disk mass in outflows. Um, I'm skipping some details here um, in the interest of time. And so just that as a motivation in, in, in mind, um, it's worth thinking about uh, sort of some of the basic physics of uh, these post-merger accretion disks. Um, because weakened actions are really key here in setting the composition of the disk and the evolution of the disk and then sort of the outflow and nuclear synthesis uh, conditions and therefore the kilonova signature as well. And so the basic question uh, that, you know, we want to address is um, when, how, and if uh, weak interactions become important in these post-merger scenario as we scan the uh, parameter space for uh, neutron star binaries. And so the first thing to start with is to realize essentially that in these disks, if you include magnetic fields, turbulence is really mediated by the MRI, by the magneto rotational instability that provides angular momentum transport and forces material to accrete onto the black hole. So material falls gradually into the potential of the black hole, uh, binding energy is uh, converted into heat. And um, if the density and temperature um, is high enough in the, in the disk, uh, then weak interactions become uh, important. So if we get to the weak energy scale, uh, neutrinos will be emitted and they carry away some of that heat. So they cool the disk. Um, and, uh, and that's a strong function of density and temperature. So as you go away from the midplane, uh, weak interactions, the emissivities uh, decrease rapidly. And so in what we call the hot corona, um, this viscous heating from MHD turbulence cannot be offset by cooling anymore. And this is how you generate outflows from, um, from that uh, accretion disk. Now, when are these uh, weak interactions actually important for the evolution of the post-merger system? Well, you can quantify that um, by looking at the ratio of uh, the rate of neutrino uh, emissions of the um, energy uh, sort of cooling um, um, of via neutrino emission um, over the uh, rate of viscous heating. So uh, sort of over the, the rate of advection of thermal energy 
um, uh, toward the black hole. And so for your, cl clearly for weak interactions to become important, that ratio has to become order of unity. And so you assuming um, a simple 1D alpha disk model, uh, you can actually translate that in so analytically. And so you'll see the calculation in, in the upcoming paper into a condition on the accretion rate in uh, in the post merger accretion disk. So it is proportional. So it is proportional to the alpha uh, viscosity uh, to the power of five thirds uh, and has a coefficient that depends on the black hole mass and spin. Um, but that's really all it is. And so um, if the accretion rate is above that threshold, uh, weakened actions are important and the composition changes over time. And so the nuclear synthesis signature changes over time. If you're below that, then weakened actions are marginally important or not important at all. And um, so your initial composition will not change dramatically. Um, so for typical plugging in typical numbers that we have for these post merger systems, that critical accretion rate is on the order of 10 to the minus uh, three solar masses per second. And so this can be translated into an initial accretion disk mass because sort of the two go uh, together uh, one to one. Now, in order to simulate these, these systems, what do we need to take into account? Well, I just wanted to um, point out the importance of, uh, of MHD uh, in order to get uh, things self consistently. So if, you, if I go back to this formula here, you see that essentially this ignition threshold for weak interactions is determined by turbulence or by, uh, um, by a quantity that um, uh, sort of characterizes turbulence, which is the alpha parameter. And so if you, if you treat that as a parameter in alpha disk models, you can get all sorts of scenarios and you can sort of tune weak interactions to become important or not, depending on what you like. But in MHD, this is really sort of self-consistently set um, by, um, by MHD turbulence. And uh, that therefore also self-consistently um, sets the accretion rate onto the black hole. The alpha viscosity, if you uh, sort of extract that from an MHD simulation, you can see that here on the top right, is actually high, highly variable, uh, both in space and time. Um, so th that's actually a fairly complicated um, quantity. Also more subtle, uh, the, you know, the, the nature of turbulence uh, is, is, is different. So MHD turbulence via sort of more convective turbulence in, in what you would get in, in, um, in a pure hydro case. Also, there's uh, non-local dissipation of magnetic energy that you get in the MHD case. Uh, so uh, you can see this down here, this clear, this nice butterfly diagram that is indicative of a dynamo signature here, where you see essentially that poloidal uh, uh, toroidal, um, um, apologies, uh, toroidal fields are generated in the in the midplane, um, and so magnetic energy is, is created in the midplane, and then uh, sort of slowly migrates towards higher latitudes, where it's dissipated into heat and contributes to heating of that um, of that hot corona. And you can clearly see here the magnetic cycles of um, opposite um, polarity. Uh, 3D is also crucial um, because um, you have an inverse turbulent cascade in 2D. There's an anti-dynamo theorem in 2D. Uh, that uh, sort of prevents any stationary turbulent state, um, which is uh, an important fact because for the time scales that we consider these post-merger accretion disks, you need to make sure that um, uh, steady turbulent um, These systems are fairly insensitive to the high density nuclear part, but um, it's important to uh, cover the important physics at low densities and temperatures, and that has been already discussed here at the, at the workshop um, as well. Radiation transport um, is, uh, in terms of a leakage scheme and sort of approximate absorption via um, a light bulb scheme, which is what we use here, is appropriate at low end dot, but as you go to a high end dot, uh, transport properties become uh, increasingly important, and I'll uh, get to this in a second. So just to show you essentially the three basic cases that we simulated here, so starting from this basic physical insight that uh, you have a critical accretion threshold, uh, ignition threshold for weak interactions in these post-merger accretion disks, we wanted to simulate disks that are um, clearly below the threshold and then close to the threshold and above the threshold. And you can see that this actually turned out to be uh, the case. So um, here I'm plotting the radiative efficiency, so the total um, luminosity radiated in neutrinos uh, um, over m dot c squared. And uh, so there's a maximum radiative efficiency for disks um, because uh, that's the maximum. So if you converted all the binding energy at the disk go into, um, into radiation, that is what you would get. Um, but you never really achieve that because some of uh, that binding energy, some of that heat is always attracted into the black hole. But as you can see, we get fairly close to that um, once we are above this ignition threshold. The yellow band here indicates this, um, uh, essentially the, this ignition threshold with some uncertainty uh, that we roughly estimate analytically from this analytic criterion. And this is exactly what we see in, um, in the DRMHD uh, case here. We do see um, 
that for these neutrino pooled accretion disks, uh, so these high M dot disks, we get um, typical mass ejector, so total um, uh, masses of uh, round, so say 30 to 40 percent. Uh, there's some uncertainties to that, and I'll, I'll get to this at the end. Um, um, however, if you go into this advection dominated regime below the ignition threshold, um, that, um, that fraction can become uh, a lot higher because the disks are much more puffy because of inefficient cooling, and so they evaporate more effectively uh, their, their material. Now, in terms of uh, the uh, evolution on, of composition, so that's essentially what we find here. You see the three cases uh, on the left, it's the highest M dot case in the center, there's the one close to the ignition threshold, and then on the right, there's uh, the advection dominated um, regime case. And um, so as expected in the outer parts of these accretion disks, um, things uh, protonize over time. That's uh, expected. We start from very neutron rich initial conditions of uh, YE around 0.1. And uh, so that gradually rises over time. Um, uh, as expected, you can actually um, um, derive that analytically from the, the equation of, of lepton number conservation, which we did. And you find something that uh, it should scale with the accretion rate as m dot to the power of minus uh, 5 over 4. And so this is exactly what you see. So uh, the lower the accretion rate, the, the, the longer it takes uh, for the system to, to protonize. Um, in the inner accretion disk, however, um, um, you see a different uh, behavior. Um, once we're uh, close to the ignition threshold or above it, uh, the density becomes high enough. Uh, so for uh, the electron, electrons to become generated in that um, uh, fluid. And so that changes uh, weak interactions. Um, that's some, an effect that we found before, but here you can nicely see how this effect um, sets on as you cross this ignition threshold for weak interactions. Um, so the, the basic point being that uh, uh, electrons become degenerate, so you can form electron-positron pairs only in the tail of the Fermi distribution that's exponentially suppressed. And so you don't have positrons around, essentially, and that favors electron capture onto protons, and so you convert protons into neutrons, and that neutra neutronizes. Um, the, the inner part of the accretion disk. And that's important because it provides a uh, neutron rich reservoir of material that can be fed into the winds and that keeps the overall YE of the outflow uh, fairly low over um, a long period of time. Now, what does that mean in terms of uh, the total outflow of the, um, of the system? Um, so if we integrate over these outflows, we, we can see a nucleosynthesis analysis on the top left here. Um, where you can clearly see that as you switch on weak interactions, uh, so as you go to higher M dot uh, disks, uh, you clearly uh, get significant contributions of first to second peak R process uh, uh, material. So you get more blue uh, emissions, or that would result in a blue kilonova signature, uh, while the, the heavy elements uh, tend to be reduced um, at some point, only slightly so far, but as, as you would go to even higher accretion rates, uh, that could, that could uh, still continue to drop. Um, you, you can see this also, it's reflected also in the YE distribution, which you can see here on the right, and you clearly see this ignition trend in these disks. So at uh, low M dot, uh, the green um, um, histogram uh, essentially only shows mild adjustment with respect to the initial conditions, which is uh, YE equals uh, uh, 0.1. And that's because weak interactions are really slow in this, in this case, and uh, so protonization takes a long time. Um, Close to the ignition threshold, you see already quite some modification. Um, things have already gotten um, uh, more blue. Um, and then um, as you go clearly above the ignition threshold, you get uh, this wide distribution of, of YE um, that uh, we've seen before and that has also been found by, by other people, obviously. Uh, and then the bottom is just, uh, the bottom plot is just, again, sort of uh, conveying the same uh, idea in a, in a different way. Uh, where we plot the mass fraction that's contained, the integrated mass fraction in the, in the three different R process peaks. And you can see this clear trend that as you move across the ignition threshold, you see that the first peak R process elements really uh, start to increase. Um, the second and third R process elements are always there because of the neutron rich initial conditions. But then as you go uh, to very high uh, M dot, at some point the third peak starts to decline. Um, and uh, and that is uh, um, and that is partially due to weak interactions uh, obviously becoming important, but also because of absorption um, taking on a more dominant role. And um, so I also encourage you to take a look at um, the paper by Miller et al, who have looked at this 
uh, at a very high M dot case uh, with uh, sort of a more accurate neutrino transport. And in, indeed, they also find that um, um, absorption there is actually quite important. Uh, just a, a, a quick note on um, MHD versus hydro outflows. Um, and that point out the caveat of, of, of these accretion dust simulations. It's very hard uh, right now to do uh, GRMHD uh, simulations over across the whole uh, parameter space and then over very long times, um, uh, including the, the entire lifetime of these accretion disks. Um, and so um, what we really uh, include here are these early uh, GRMHD outflows. So there's a nice comparison here done by Rodrigo Fernandez and collaborators uh, recently. Uh, looking at these uh, differences between uh, hydro outflows and GRMHT outflows. So these GRMHT outflows are fairly fast. They occur um, fairly rapidly and you eject roughly half of the total ejector mass over the first few hundred milliseconds. Um, and then the second part uh, comes, uh, comes out later um, over, you know, the sort of sec um, uh, toward um, uh, time scale of a second or so. Um, and, um, and these late time outflows uh, can be at some point of viscous nature um, compar comparatively to what you would get in, a, um, in an alpha disk uh, simulation. And indeed, you, you can see this here in this, in this, uh, in this plot. These hydro outflows, um, they tend to be uh, very late. So if you were only to, <clears throat> if you were not to include uh, GRMHD, you would get outflows, but it would take um, at least a viscous time scale, which is on the order of a second for these systems, for some outflows to, to, to show up. <clears throat> and so that's the, the, the crucial difference here. Um, just moving on um, as a sort of final aspect uh, to this, I just wanted to point out that there's very interesting um, uh, applications of the essentially very same physics in different astrophysical contexts, namely collapse stars. So the collapse of rapidly rotating massive stars that are thought to you know, be progenitors of long gamma ray bursts and their accompanying uh, broadline type 1c supernovae. Um, and so what happens in these systems is essentially that the, the uh, massive star collapses and due to the angular momentum in the system, material cannot just like radially fall and accrete onto the, onto the black hole, but, um, or onto the proto-neutron star first and then form a black hole, but it actually has to circularize um, at some point depending on what the angular momentum distribution in the progenitor star actually is. And typically what you, uh, what you find uh, with uh, some of these accretion fallback models that uh, you can reach accretion rates that are fairly similar to uh, the neutron star merger case. And so uh, you can suspect that the similar uh, physical conditions would hold and similar physical processes would hold. And that's exactly what we went after um, in, in uh, also in, in, in still fairly recent work, uh, looking at accretion disks that would form in, in such a collapse star scenario, where again, you have such an ignition threshold for weak interactions. And in this early phase indicated here on the top left, uh, M.1 and M.2, you're still in a regime uh, above a critical accretion rate um, in which the, uh, the um, we can, in which we can actions become important. And uh, especially in the inner part of the accretion disk, again, um, you find the same phenomenon that electron capture is, is capture generally and you convert uh, initially a material that is at point uh, at ye point five so equal numbers of neutron and protons into something that's actually neutron rich and so you can find uh, conditions for um, up process outflows from these uh, collapse or accretion disks and uh, that's uh, reflected in the in the top right um, nucleosynthesis study where again you see for m dot one m dot two once you're above a critical ignition threshold for weakened actions, you do get our process outflows, while below that you only end up with nickel 56 and, uh, and alpha particles. So uh, I didn't have time to talk about um, uh, this, but just to flash this at the, at the very end. Um, um, so taking into account rates and ejector masses and aspects of chemical evolution, none of which I had time to talk about, um, you can arrive at this uh, conjecture essentially that maybe uh, outflows from such compact accretion disks, meaning in neutron star mergers and in collapsers, could actually uh, synthesize most of the galactic caviar process uh, elements. That's very speculative at this point uh, because we, we still don't know much about these systems, but uh, it might be true, it might be wrong, uh, something that we can definitely test in the, in the next couple of years with, uh, with new observations. Um, and I just find it very intriguing if, if nature would have chosen these accretion disks to actually populate the bottom rows of the periodic table with, uh, with heavy outprocess elements. And that brings me to the conclusions. Um, time is up. Um, 
so I, I was trying to point out essentially that in these post-merge accretion disks, at least to sort of zero order, um, what determines the physics and the composition of the outflows is really a single parameter, which is the accretion rate um, that controls the, um, the significance of weak interactions and therefore the uh, protonization or neutroni neutronization rates. Um, and that can be translated into essentially a value of the initial uh, uh, disk mass model of some, um, some adjustments. So there's really two regimes here, neutrino cooled or advection dominated. Um, um, you, could, you could argue there's a third regime at very high end dot where uh, absorption becomes so important that it's, it's mostly setting the, um, uh, the, the, the YE of at least part of the outflow. Um, and uh, sort of what I was po pointing out here, um, while the accretion disk evolution itself is fairly sort of uh, insensitive to the, high to the high density equation of state of the nuclear part, um, um, physics at low density and temperatures have, have to be included. But the formation of the accretion disks are, um, as uh, Francois also pointed out this, 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 uh, earlier this morning, is uh, so the formation of accretion disks are not independent of, um, of the nuclear equation of state part. Um, yeah, as I was pointing out, GRMHD and three space dimensions are really crucial here um, uh, to, to capture the, the correct physics. Uh, there are caveats here, obviously. Um, so we didn't include viscous, the, the late time viscous regime uh, that may uh, enhance the Y distribution somewhat. But at the time that we end these simulations at a few hundred milliseconds, typically most of these accretion disks have already frozen out in terms of weakened actions. And so YE will not be changed dramatically um, uh, over sort of the, the second half of their evolution. So uh, at least to some degree, the, the YE distribution should be uh, representative. Um, at high M dot, which we are not focusing on here, um, you'd need um, a, a sort of better neutrino uh, transport. And that's clearly something that needs to be uh, looked at in, in more detail in the future. Also, initial conditions obviously matter. Um, so it's been shown um, uh, by others, by Christy et al, for example, that, and Francois was also alluding to that earlier this morning, that uh, the initial magnetic field structure can also have some impact that you can have, you know, can add or subtract 10% uh, or so in terms of the total ejector mass that you, um, that you would get from these MHG outflows. And finally, I was pointing out with collapsers and everything that um, um, uh, it could be, in, in principle at least, that these accretion disks could be responsible for most of the um, heavy galactic art process. And um, I'll stop here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions. The first one from Agnieszka. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is about the, the accretion rate. Uh, and what is the, the maximum value? Because you are giving uh, some um, small values for the accretion rate, like 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 2, minus 1 in short gamma ray burst. And uh, also in long gamma ray burst, they are uh, similar in your, uh, in your models. Uh, and as far as I remember from some old simulations, uh, there used to be a claim that there is a systematic difference and accretion rates in the short gamma ray burst engines are higher, like even on the order of one or more than one solar mass per second. So uh, how robust are these numbers in case, uh, mostly for, for the short gamma ray burst engines? Yeah, uh, that, that's a really good question. Thank you. So yeah, so there's uh, several aspects. So um, regarding the simulations, uh, we've been focusing on you know accretion rates around this ignition threshold, and so you can expand, so you can sort of extrapolate some of the results of the highest accretion rates we simulated to even higher accretion rates. So the basic physics will be the same. The difference will be uh, how important absorption will be on on uh, on the outflow composition, but the basic physics will be the same. Now observationally. Um, uh, for accretion rates in short gamma ray bursts and long gamma ray bursts. So uh, first of all, the, the accretion rate uh, uh, varies with time, um, obviously. So there's not a single accretion rate for these, for these systems. So both for collapsars, the accretion rate um, varies dramatically, even over the lifetime of the, of the DRB potentially. Uh, same for, for short gamma ray bursts um, 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 as well. Uh, typically, I think it's inferred that overall averaging essentially over the whole burst, uh, I, I think, I mean, that's my vague recollection. I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but I, I thought that usually it's been argued that these, um, the, the, the uh, sort of luminosities, if you judge from the luminosities, um, you, would, uh, you would get roughly similar um, um, accretion rates. Does that roughly answer your question? Yes, 
Uh, yes, yes, more or less, yes. I was just thinking that uh, 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 as far for the physics, if you go to really high accretion rates, then density is high and uh, also some effects like uh, degeneracy of, of neutrons and protons could be. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, really, yeah, very good question. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, so so I just pulled up the, the plot here again uh, from the collapser scenario. So initially, as the black hole forms and as, you know, the, the, the long gamma reverse jet is, is supposed to form, we have very high accretion rates and that can be of the order, as you say, of the order of a solar mass per second, as you can see here, so on, on, on the left. Um, but th that accretion phase is very brief and not a whole, so in, in, you see on the x-axis is the uh, cumulative uh, accreted mass. And you can see that there's, there's not a whole lot of mass that's being accreted at these high accretion rates. So most of the matter will be accreted at much lower accretion rates where some of the effects that you mentioned uh, will likely not be important. Uh, so you would be in the regime of 10 to the minus one and uh, lower um, accretion rates. And that's where we think most of the R process material is, is being generated in these systems. And that's a fairly comparative, uh, uh, sort of fairly similar, uh, similar regime as what, you know, we would typically find in neutron star binary uh, systems. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question from Julian. When you spoke about the distinction between um, when you got an ignition of, new, of neutrino cooling and so on, you posed it as a function of accretion rate. Mm -hmm. But what I couldn't quite tell was whether your control on accretion rate from actual simulations or alpha modeling. Okay, so uh, yes, you're right. So. Um, so as I as I said um, earlier here, I'm trying to go back to the slide. So um, this ignition threshold, uh, if you just assume a, um, an alpha, this model, uh, so you can control that threshold uh, just by setting um, this, uh, this alpha parameter. There's a, there's a hook in there, which is that, as you correctly stressed, the um, nature of the, the stresses and the heating depends strongly on both radius and height in the disk in MT. And right. did you take that into it when you figure you're eating? Yes, so, so essentially what we are doing here is, uh, so in, cho in choosing these simulations essentially is we are, you know, guessing. So there is some engineering uh, involved in this and some sort of educated guessing for the initial conditions required to sort of uh, um, uh, get to the to the right physical state that, that, that you're interested in. Um, and so uh, to, to sort of first order, you can, there's a, there's a linear relationship between the accretion rate and the total initial mass of, um, of, the, of the accretion rate, at least if you believe in alpha disk models. And from that, you can get some basic guidance on how to choose, uh, on how to choose these models. Um, and uh, so this is essentially what we did. And then you'd hope that, you know, in the MHD case, you find something qualitatively similar. Um, huh. Although, you know, globally things may, may be very different. Yeah, when I'm speaking specifically, um, MHD creation, ordinary accretion disks routinely show that the heating rate per unit mass increases as you move away from the equatorial plane. Yes, correct. And if you could write that report. Excuse me, can you just repeat the last sentence? It, it was interrupted. I didn't get oh, all, okay. of the, all of the, the question. Um, MHD simulations of ordinary accretion disks show the heating rate per unit mass or the effective local effective alpha for dissipation, mm -hmm. I'll describe it, increases as you move away from the equatorial plane and up into the corona. And right. did you take any, that could make a big difference when you're looking for outflows. Oh yeah, that's right. I mean, that's 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 all included here, and I, I could show you plot. I don't have any plots here, but I can, I can show you how that actually changes. So so, so that, that that's that's really all included. So I'm I'm essentially talking here about sort of mid plane properties uh, that I sort of roughly extrapolate uh, from alpha disk models just to get a basic idea of what you know the order of magnitude uh, regime would be. 
Um, and then obviously, as you, as you correctly mentioned, in, in MHD, things are very different. And, um, um, and so you hope to find a system um, um, uh, and, and to explore the physics um, across, uh, and you sort of look if you know, such an accretion, ignition threshold actually exists in the same sense as it would in alpha disk models. And that's exactly what we, what we find here. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, uh, very much for, for your talk. And thanks to all the speakers. And uh, I 